Okay. Okay, this is um, a lecture on uh, my fourth and final lecture on the pre-Socratic philosophers. And then we'll move on to that giant at the beginnings of Western thought, namely Plato. Um, I think I've said enough about Heraclitus. So we'll move on to Parmenides. And I'm just going to share with you a few insights, um, a bit original on my part, uh, about Parmenides and Heraclitus. But before we begin that, um, let, let me just remind you that we passed over a, a, a lot of the great thinkers from this pre-Socratic time, from the so-called enlightenment of ancient Greek thought, namely Empedocles, Democrates, the Pythagorean school, and so many others. But it's always a balancing act um, when you're dealing with a course of this nature. You want to give a survey and at the same time not let it be superficial. So I'm trying to do both. But with Parmenides now, um, so Parmenides and Heraclitus um, provide a crossroads, as I've been talking about, at the beginning of Western thought. And um, so this is a new idea on my part. By the way, before I, I, I go on, um, a thought struck me this morning that I think might uh, be worth sharing with you because we've, we've been talking about the birth of philosophy and the birth of something always reveals the nature of that thing. In fact, the very word, when we say the nature of something, we mean it's, it's essence, it's, it's whatness. I mean, the word nature can have, has different meanings. It can mean the trees and the stars and the ground and water and so on, but it can also mean how something is, the whatness of things, the quiddity as the philosophers call it. And so if you can um, penetrate into the birth of something, then, then you, you get close to the nature of something. Knowing the origin and the genesis of something helps you to understand its nature. So by penetrating into the birth of philosophy, we begin to gain a sense of what philosophy is. And I've always thought that philosophy shares something in common both with science and art. And um, because it shares something in common with science because it's a discovery. The philosopher is discovering something. But it also shares something in common with art because art is opening up new ways of seeing things. Art is creating new, something new. And so if you combine those two things, you have the pre-Socratic philosophers who were the first scientists, but they were also had one foot in this poetic wisdom, I told you, of the heroic age of the Greeks. They were sort of straddling both worlds. The poetic wisdom of the heroic age of the Greeks and this dawning of the age of man. So there's something of the artist in these first thinkers. They're creating something new. And so philosophy is, so what is it that the philosopher is creating? and at the same time discovering. How can you combine these two things, creativity and discovery? Well, it dawned on me that what the philosopher is doing then is creating new ways of seeing reality. They're, just, they're creating modes of disclosure. And so by assuming the optics of that thinker by getting inside that thinker and looking at the world through his or her eyes, you're seeing new dimensions of reality, uh, of the essence of reality that were previously covered. So you have, it, but it dawned on me this morning that that's precisely what these pre-Socratics were, having one foot in science and one foot in art. They were discovering something and at the same time they were creating something. They're creating modes of disclosure. So by knowing the nature of something, the or, actually it's in the very word nature, nashere means to be born, like nativity. And so if you can know the birth and genesis of something, then you can know its nature. So we're looking at the birth 
and early genesis of philosophy, and by so doing, entering into the nature of philosophy. Okay, so one of the great Eleatic philosophers who came about 25 years after Heraclitus was Parmenides, and he was at his prime about 475 BC, and Heraclitus at 500 BC. So it's about 20, it's about 25 years later. And if you go carefully, I, I gave you, um, the reason I posted my lectures, um, I read parts of them to you, but there's no reason to read my lectures, you know, that because I just read them to you. But the reason I posted it was, I actually scanned the fragments of Heraclitus and Parmenides, and that way you could have the original text before you. I tried to just, um, cut it out, but it wouldn't let me do it, so I just posted the whole thing. So you have all the fragments of Heraclitus. We have quite a bit, actually. And um, so the, the fragments have like four parts. The first part is called the pre uh, prologue, and then it has the way of truth and the way of opinion. And then there's some fragments toward the end, the last part, where it have to do with the, uh, the natural world and the origin of the natural world. So rather than go through all the, the texts, uh, let me just make some comments and, and then I'll um, show you some, uh, talk about some implications and then we can see concretely as, as we traverse um, the classical Greek period and then the Hellenistic period um, and then on to early and middle and late medieval times, all the way to the dawning of the Renaissance, we can trace elements of the Parmenidean versus the Heraclitean worldview. So the thing I'd like you to notice at the beginning, uh, well, the poem was written in hexameter verse, so that, that's interesting. It's poetry in that sense, so that's the foot that, Her that Parmenides has in uh, the poetic wisdom of the heroic age. And if you read the prologue, you'll see how artful it is. And, but it's not mythology in the literal sense of the word, because the whole thing is a foil. It's a structure in order for him to articulate his philosophy. So like I said before, these early thinkers were using poetic imagery, but not in the same way that the theological and epic poets were that came before them. Those images were original disclosures. They're not metaphors or similes. But here we have someone who's fully capable of thinking abstractly. In fact, it's very abstract thinking, but at the same time, he's using metaphor and simile so the whole first part, the mayors which carried me, conveyed me as far as my desire reached when the goddess who were driving, uh, you know, and he makes his way to the portal of the entrance of truth, you know, and all the rest, that's all um, poetry and it's in poetic verse, but it's all working for the sake of revealing this new dimension of reality that he wants to create and discover and namely the way of truth. And the goddess received me kindly and took my right hand in hers and thus she spoke to me. Young man, companion of immortal charioteers. By the way, Plato will utilize this notion of the, this image of the charioteer and his great, his great myth of the procession of the gods in um, the Phaedrus. Um, but we'll talk about that later when we come to Plato. So he makes his way with the charioteer and they make their way um, to the portal. And the goddess tells him, you shall inquire into everything, both the motionless heart of well-rounded truth. That's the key idea in Parmenides. Let me just say something as an aside here before we move on. Sometimes the reflect, um, thinking about the pre-Socratic can be a daunting task. And one of the reasons is the fragmented nature of their thought. So it's up to us to like piece things together. Well, like when you're making a puzzle, you try to find a piece that's 
important that has a lot of sides. And once you find that key piece, then you can find all the other pieces that fit to that piece. So what, what I would suggest to you, not just with the pre-Socratics, but any philosophy, always look for his or her ultimate concern. What is it that concerns this person ultimately? And then once you put your finger on that, then everything else will light up and you'll find how to relate everything else. And this is all the more important with the pre-Socratics because so all we have are fragments, like putting together a puzzle. So this is the key idea in Parmenides. Well-rounded truth. So what is, and then he, the goddess tells him, I'm going to also tell you about the opinions of mortals. That's a very carefully chosen word. The Greek word for opinion is doxa. So there's episteme, which is knowledge, and then there's opinion, doxa. And so Heraclitus associates opinion with the multitudes, with mortals. But now he's going to give the mortals that are listening to him, he, as he claims, the truth. And also, she says, I'll give to you the opinions of mortals in which there is no true reliability. So there's something he wants to reveal that most people pass by. That's going to be a hallmark of philosophy. It's going to be the key idea in Plato's famous allegory, the cave, which some of you have already studied. That the hoi polloi, the, the, the multitudes, are passing by what's most important. But nevertheless, the goddess tells him, thou shalt learn these things, these opinions. Also, how one should go through all the things that seem. This is very important because we're going to see the history of Western philosophy, at least if you concentrate on the metaphysics and the history of philosophy is essentially the history of metaphysics. There's always going to be, not always, but for the most part, a distinction between mere appearance, that is, that which seems, and then reality. And Parmenides is the great spokesman of this dichotomy, that there's mere appearance, and then there's reality. So the mere appearance is what the mortals see. Reality is what the immortals know. And he's going to share with mortals this immortal vision. But this is something we need to hold on to, and you'll see it working. In fact, one could take uh, do an experiment. I've never done it, but you could just take the history of philosophy encyclopedia and open it at random. Close your eyes, open the book at random, and point, and start reading. And sooner or later, you're going to be reading about the difference between mere appearance and reality, if you're in the in metaphysics. That's how predominant this is. And they may use different words, like Immanuel Kant will talk about the thing in itself, the noumenal world, as opposed to the phenomenal world. Um, they'll use different words. But basically, it's reality versus mere appearance. So here we find the first talk of that. So the goddess is going to tell uh, him in the first, uh, this is number, the, as you know, the fragments are, are, are numbered. And with Heraclitus, we have 25 fragments. The last six are dubious, but um, so the first one is, is key. It sets up the structure and um, it tells the main point that I'm going to tell you the way of truth and the way of opinion. And I got this from the goddess. I made my way to the portal and of the divine. Come, she says to him, and you must accept my word when you've heard it. The way the ways of inquiry, which alone are to be thought. Okay, then he says what it is. And this sounds really strange, especially to the non-philosophers, somebody who's not accustomed to thinking about metaphysical things, that the main point of the whole thing is uh, that it is. <laughs> I mean, that sounds so strange to people, but how can that be profound to say it is? But what does he mean by that? Once you unpack that, it's very profound. So this is the main idea that it is. Now it refers to being with a capital B. Okay, that's important. Not being with a little b, but it might be that too. 
this is confusing. But for now, just think about being with a capital B, it. That's why he capitalized, they, they capitalized it. It is. And it is not possible for it, namely being, not to be. Okay, so there, there is no non-being. It doesn't exist. So this is his main teaching. Now, everything else is going to fall within that, but we need to unpack that and find the meaning of it. I always taught, when you, there are levels of knowing something. The first level is just put the pieces together. Like, for example, Parmenides said that it is, and it's impossible for it not to be. That's it. And then the next step is try to understand what that means. And otherwise, you're just repeating like a parrot, you know, who has no understanding of what the parrot is saying. You're just parroting, as they say. So that's, the, that's where you need a teacher sometimes at the beginning to help you. And then the furthest level is to evaluate that. So after interpretation, there's evaluation. You think about, do I agree? Do I disagree? Why? And you, you do your critical thinking. And then there's another level where you assimilate your own evaluation of what you interpreted. So there are different levels of understanding. And each, each within those four levels, there's, I mean, you want to be precise at the first level. Second one, you want to give it enough energy and thought that you're unpacking the deeper meaning of it, that you really feel like you're in proximity what the author intended. That's the philological element. But the critical thinking part is to ask yourself, do I agree? Do I disagree? Why? Play it off other ideas. Play it off your own observations of the world. And then you assimilate your own evaluation of the interpretation. Okay, so she's going to tell us these, or Parmenides is speaking, right? And he's just pretending like he heard this from the goddess, or maybe he had a vision and he, he actually believes he got it from the goddess, but he wants to use this as the foil to express his ideas. So it's impossible for it not to be. This is the way of credibility. That, in other words, the way of truth, for it follows truth. The other, that it is not. So what that means is non-being doesn't exist. And that it is bound not to be. This, I tell you, is a path that cannot be explored. And the reasons he's going to give for you is you can't think non-being. As soon as you think anything, it's being. Even if you think non-being, like let's think about non-being in, in the sense of with a little b, like you make a rendezvous with your friend. You say, I'm going to meet at the fountain at noon. And you go there at noon and he doesn't show up. And now it's 10 afternoon and now it's 1230. He doesn't show up. So not showing up, that's non-being. But the longer he doesn't show up, the more his non-showing up comes into being. So even non-being has to come into being in order to show itself as non-being. So there's no getting around being, even things that are not there. If I walk in the classroom and I can't find chalk to write on the chalkboard, the fact that there is no chalk comes into presence. There is no chalk. So the fact that there's no chalk has to come into presence. So. Parmenides is thinking about, you can't think non-being. And you can't even say it. If you say it, then it's, it, it comes into being. So it can't be uttered. It can't be thought. And the goddess tells Parmenides, and Parmenides is telling us, this, I tell you, is the path that cannot be explored. And why? Because you can't think it. As soon as you think non-being, it comes into being. And then he gives one reason here. Why can't you explore the fact that non-being is? Well, you could neither recognize it. You couldn't recognize non-being, nor could you express it. Because as soon as you express anything that is not in being, it comes into, that absence comes into presence. So there's no getting around presence. 
and presence is being. So that's a pretty strong argument. Okay, so um, the next fragment, which is related, once you start piecing things together, you can see the relationship, but the next one just says, it's the same thing to think and, and to be. It's the same thing to think and to be. I remember Heidegger wrote a whole like 50 page essay with ancient Greek and it's really hard to even follow unless you've studied ancient Greek, but it's deep and profound. It's all on that third fragment. It's the same thing to think and to be. But let's not worry about Heidegger now. It just means that as soon as you think something, it is. And thinking and being are connected. I think he's, the reason he, that, that fragment is there is that for reasons I just said earlier, that even if you try to think non-being, the thinking of non-being are one and the same and then non-being comes into being. So it's the same thing to think and to be. So if I try to think non-being, then that thinking brings non-being into being. The non-being appears as non-being, but it appears and comes into presence. So presence is being. And then the fourth fragment, observe nevertheless how things absent are surely present to the mind. That's what I've been dwelling on. He wants you to uh, think about that. Things that are absent, like my friend who doesn't show up at the fountain, comes into my presence. That's the grieving period when you lose something you love. That's what grief is, coming into the presence of absence. For it will never sever being from its connection with being. So capital B is connected to being. So he has this vision of this one being. It is all the same for me from the fourth. Well, let's finish that fourth fragment. For it will never sever being from its connection with being, whether it is scattered everywhere utterly throughout the universe or whether it is collected together. In other words, whether being is infinite or there's one being surrounded by non-being, by limits, it's still all being collected together. And then the fifth one, he says, it's all the same for me to, from what point I begin, for I shall return to that same point again. The way I make sense of that one is no matter where you start, the center is everywhere. So wherever you start, Wherever you are, spatially, you're at the center because being is equal in all directions. And then six, he comes out with it. One should both say and think that being is. He, he's already said that, but now he says it again. And then he gives some reasons. For to be is possible and nothingness is not possible. Thus I command you to consider or from the latter way of search, first of all, I debar you. This is the goddess talking to Parmenides, so-called. And now you can, you can see very clearly that Parmenides has Her Heraclitus in mind. So there's a polemics going on. Usually polemos, I told you earlier, means war in Greek, but it can take on different meanings in different contexts. Usually the polemics means some quarrel going on, like, I don't put anything on Facebook, you know, that uh, you know, when I do, I just delete it right away because I know somebody's going to come back and just say the opposite and then it'll, it'll create polemics and then nobody is happy. So just forget it. Um, but they're still speaking truth to power is important too, but that's another issue. But polemics usually means like quarreling with somebody. Uh, and, um, but it, there's, a, there's different levels of polemics. He's engaging in polemics with Heraclitus, there's no doubt. He never mentions Heraclitus by name, at least we don't have any, yeah. but the, it's so close and the metaphors are all so close that he has Parmenides in mind, or Heraclitus in mind. Right here, for example, where he says, next I debar you from, that's supposedly the goddess talking to um, Parmenides. I debar you 
from that way along which wander mortals. He always connects the way of opinion with mortals. With, and now he's going to give you the immortal truth. Knowing nothing, two-headed. See, there's Heraclitus. He's of two minds, like contradictory ideas. For perplexity in their bosoms stirs their intelligence astray. They don't really know, he's saying. They, they have contradictory ideas and they're fine with that contradiction. But see, the difference is that, well, we'll talk about Heraclitus later, but it's on this point that he's going to part company with Heraclitus. And he has Heraclitus in mind right here. Remember, it was like Heraclitus became a famous philosopher. He's only 25 years older than Parmenides. And some people were starting to be influenced by Heraclitus. And now he's engaging in polemics. He says, they are carried off as deaf as they are blind, amazed, uncritical, hordes by whom to be and not to be are regarded as the same and not the same. Okay, he has Heraclitus in mind. In everything, there is a way of opposing stress. See, that's definitely, in fact, there's a footnote in the Ancilla. It just says, Heraclitus, fragment eight. Let's take a quick look at fragment eight. That which is, you know, fragment eight is, that which is uh, in opposition is in consort. And from things that differ comes the most beautiful harmony. So it's, he has definitely uh, Heraclitus in mind there. So we have these polemics going on at the beginning between these two important pre-Socratic philosophers, Heraclitus and Parmenides. For this view can never predominate, what view? That that which is, that that which is not exists. So that's it. You must debar your thought from this way of search, nor let ordinary experience in, the ver in its variety force you along its way. Um, but you must judge by means of reason. So the Greek word is logos. Sometimes they translate the word logos into reason. It can mean reason, it can mean language. Actually, um, Heidegger taught me that the word logos comes from legain in Greek, L-E-G-E-I-N. And it, it means three things at once. It means to say, it means to place, and it means to collect, to gather. But sometimes it, it's often translated as reason. There is only one other description of the way remaining, namely that what is, is. <laughs> That's a funny because people say what is, is. It is what it is. <laughs> That's one of the expressions that people uh, use today. But it matters who says it, you know, in, in the context in which it's said. So now it's Heraclitus speaking. Now it has some depth. To, do, to this way, he goes on, there are very many signposts that being has no coming into being and no destruction, for it is whole of limb without motion and without end, and it never was nor it will be. If you go through this, uh, it's gonna take us all day if I go through fragment by fragment, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna make some more comments, but let me just speak impromptu now a little bit without going to a close, they call this exegesis of the text. When you, when you get very close to the text, in fact, that, that became my way. I tried to get even closer than, than most people because, you know, as a philosopher, just saying what somebody said, that's not really philosophy, that's philology. And that's an important first step. But if you're going to really be a philosopher, then you have to come up with something original uh, to say. So the only one way I found my way is, See, usually the philologists, they have a very close reading of the text, but they don't have anything original to say. And then you have some philosophers who are not really reading the text carefully. They're coming up with original ideas, but it's not close enough to the text. So what I try to do is do both. If you can get really close to the text and pay attention to all the subtleties, every nuance you can think of. And not every little thing is, is deep and important either, but sometimes the seemingly most subtle points can be profound. Um, so you want to do a very close reading of the text. And at the same time, um, stay, take a step back. You let your ingenuity kick in and your imagination and loosen up, loosen the reins. And then sometimes new ideas can come. And then you can combine this 
close philological reading with original insights. So one idea that struck me since I studied Plato carefully, when Plato describes the ideas and why, why they're real and why they're more real than their manifestation in the sensuous world, it's, it's right out of the Parmenides. You know, it, it, their descriptions, it's, it's like he had Parmenides papyrus scroll right next to him and he was just like copying it. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying he plagiarized it or anything, but his conception of why the ideas are more real than the sensuous particulars, it comes right out of Parmenides. And it's, it's, really, it's really close to this fragment seven when he says, for its whole of limb without motion, without end, it never was and never will be because it's whole altogether, one continuous for what, you know, the whole description of being is taken directly from Parmenides into Plato. Only now Plato's talking about the ideas. Parmenides is talking about the one being. So I'll stop going, um, but now let me just provide for you um, some something original on my part. And you can go through the rest of these fragments yourself. Here's, here's some things I'd like to point out. When I think critically about what he's saying, I find one big error in his thinking, Parmenides' thinking. And it's right here. It dawned on me yesterday. On page 44, L let me just read a little bit for you and, let, and uh, let me show you a, a part where I find a hole in his thinking. <laughs> no, no pun on the word hole, H-O-L-E actually. But it is motionless, he's talking about being. In the limits of mighty bonds, bonds. So as soon as I saw that word, I thought, whatever's bonded is limited. You know, his whole idea is that there is no becoming, no destruction, no coming into being, no, no passing away. There's only being with a capital B. But then the big question is then, what about this world of becoming that we live in? This world of coming to be and passing away, what metaphysical status does it have? Well, that's gonna be mere appearance for Parmenides, for Plato and Aristotle. It's a little bit complicated with Aristotle, but Platonized, Christianity, and for 2,500 years, this distinction between mere appearance and reality, where reality is unchanging, indestructible, and mere appearance is changing. But here on page 44, he says that being is motionless in the limits of mighty bonds, limits, bonds. So what, what's limited if you draw a picture, those lines delimit the form. Delimit has to do with finitude, in my mind. Whenever I think of limits, bonds, that's finitude. The reason we can't know everything is because we're limited, we're, we're finite. If we were infinite, we would know everything. But we don't know it. We make mistakes. Why? Because we're finite. Okay, so humans are called mortals because they die and limits have to do with... And then he goes on, he says, um, so being is motionless in the limits of its mighty bonds, without beginning, without cease, since becoming and destruction have been driven far away. Ah, that's a key, key idea for me. Becoming and destruction have been driven far away. What does he mean by that? They don't exist. So whatever's passing doesn't exist. It only seems to be real. And true conviction has rejected them. What? Becoming, change, death. None of that is real. And remaining the same, in the same place, it rests by itself and thus remains there fixed for Powerful necessity holds, ah, this is a key idea, holds it in the bonds of a limit, limit. 
which constrains it. He goes on even. Round about. Because it is decreed by divine law that being shall not, shall not be without boundary. See, that to me is a contradiction. So if something is bond, bonded and limited, then it has a boundary. What is that boundary but non-being? That's what he just rejected. Where does he say that it's... But since there is no spatial limit... Well, see, they, they put the word spatial in there, but the, the original Greek didn't have it. If you look on page 44, the word spatial is put in parentheses, so there was a hole in the papyrus scroll. So the, the, the text must have just said, but since there is no limit, they put the word spatial in there because whoever was translating this saw the contradiction that there's no spatial limit, but there's a limit. But let's just give it to him. Since there's no spatial limit, it is complete in every side, like the mass of well-rounded, like, like the mass of a well-rounded sphere. But if you have a well-rounded sphere, then there's something outside the sphere that makes it be round. If not, it'd just be infinitely boundless. It would be boundless. But he doesn't want to concede that it's infinite. So if it's not infinite, then it's finite. If it's finite, then non-being surrounds it. So this is a big contradiction I found in Parmenides. Where does he say it? He says it even more pointedly here. Let's see on page 44. But since there is a, there is a, but since there is a spatial limit, see, he even comes out and says it, it is complete on every side like a well-rounded sphere, equally balanced, and then he goes on and on, um, which could check it from, <clears throat> let's, let's read on here, equally balanced from its center in every direction, for it is not bond, bound to be at all at either greater or less in this direction or that, nor is there not being which could check it from reaching to the same point, nor is it possible for being to be more in this direction. See, that's the part where Plato um, took it directly uh, out of Parmenides and used it um, to describe the nature of the ideas. But there's one place where he just says it really carefully. Well, So you can uh, think about that if you'd like. I mean, I'm now this is that third level of thinking. I told you they put the pieces together. Second one, understand what it means. Third part, um, critically evaluate it. Well, I'm finding if there's a contradiction in his thinking, that if it's well-rounded being, it has to be surrounded by something. And that something that it's surrounded by has to be non-being. He even uses words like limit and a well-rounded sphere. A sphere is a sphere because it's surrounded by nothingness, by non-being. But he just rejected nothingness. So there's a contradiction. Um, the other thing I want to say uh, about Parmenides is that it makes possible um, the principle of identity. So, in modern times, and ever since the Enlightenment, there has been this assumption that humans are rational animals. That goes all the way back to Aristotle. And reason means to think logically. And logic is based on three assumptions or three laws of thought as they came to be called. And one is called the principle of excluded middle. And what that means is that P, and P can mean anything, any declarative statement, like it is daytime. P or not P is always true. So it's it is daytime, or it is not the case that it is daytime. That has to be true always. That's called the principle of excluded middle. There's another principle that says the same thing, but using different language. 
It's called the principle of non-contradiction. And that's very important. What that means is P, whatever you, you can put anything you want into P, any declarative statement. P and not P. So it is daytime and it is not the case that it is daytime. That always has to be false. Not, it can be anything, not about daytime. It, that is, this is a tree and it is not the case that this is a tree. That has to be false. And those two principles are possible only on the basis of this other principle, which is P equals P. And usually when they make the equal sign, they put three lines instead of two. And what that means is it goes both ways. The first P is equal to this P and the other P is equal to that P. It just means it goes both ways. So P is P. That's called the principle of identity. And basically what that is saying metaphysically is that so these are three metaphysical principles upon which logical reasoning is based. And I'm teaching logic this semester and there's a section in the, the newest edition of the logic book, Kopi, uh, Introduction to Logic, which is one of the best introductory books in logic. It's more than introduction, it's like co three courses in logic. But, um, and there's a whole section on these three laws of thought as they came to be called. But it dawned on me one time years ago that these three laws of thought are rooted in Parmenides. And the other, the principle of non-contradiction, principle of, ident of, of excluded middle are possible on the basis of principle of identity. So this P equals P, this is what is, is. So it means that things are either true or false. And then in Kopi, I reread Kopi because uh, I wanted to think about, I've been thinking about this for days now. Uh, and um, Kopi defends this, these three laws of thought <coughs> against <coughs> the common <coughs> criticisms. <coughs> it's my dog. <coughs> and he says, One of the defenses against the law of non-contradiction non is that people fail to distinguish the difference between contraries and contradictions. If you say it is daytime and it is nighttime, then those are contraries and contraries can belong together. But the contradiction of it is daytime, it is, is, it is not the case that it is daytime. So that doesn't mean it's natural, it's, not, it's nighttime, it's just not the case that it is daytime. So the print Kopi pointed out yesterday when I reread that, is that the, the criticism that the principle of, of non-contradiction can hold because there could be con contradictory qualities in the same sentence, same proposition, is mixing up contraries with contradictions. Well, we don't need to get involved in this um, discussion about the legitimacy of the principle of non-contradiction and, non, uh, and excluded middle, but it just dawned on me in it, uh, years ago, and I still believe that this notion that propositions are either true or false and that there's no gray in between is based on the Parm Parmenidean idea of the principle of identity. See, with Heraclitus, reality is a ceaseless flow of novelty, so no two moments can be the same. So there is no being with a little b, there's only becoming. For, Parme for Heraclitus, there's being with a capital B. Let me tell you my own position on this notion of being and becoming and then being with a little b. My own view about this is that Heraclitus and Parmenides are both correct, that there's being with a capital B and it's unchanging. And I side with both thinkers on their conception of being with a capital B. But I side with Heraclitus over Parmenides because I think non-being exists. 
If that's the case, then being with a lower case B only seems, there only seems to be beings with a lower case B. In reality, there's becoming. When you, if you, so what, what Parmenides is doing is he's taking being with a capital B and he's lifting it out of the realm of becoming. This is the, it's a transcendent notion of being. It's not imminent. But it's possible for something to be both transcendent and imminent. In fact, people say that in theology all the time without really thinking about what it means. That God is both transcendent and imminent. That's one of the creeds of Catholic theology. So if God is imminent, or if the one is imminent, then it means God is here now. It's not far away. It can be both. In fact, it does, it's bad theology to say that God is purely transcendent, because then God couldn't be omnipresent. If he were only transcendent, transcendent means not here, but in some other place beyond here. So Parmenides is giving us a transcendent notion of being. And then what happens is the divine or being with a capital B, he's not, they're not thinking theologically here, but the one is God. By the way, do you see how these pre-Socratics are all in possession of the notion of the oneness of being? They're not polytheistic, that they've got them in. By the way, you know, Anaxagoras was executed um, before Socrates. We'll, we'll talk about that more when we think about Socrates. But it was dangerous sometimes. It depends on how tyrannical the regime was in politics. If you said the wrong thing or believed the wrong thing and were famous, then you're punished. You could be punished. Okay, so they're all in possession of this notion of the one even though they were living in a polytheistic worldview. But the one of Parmenides is purely transcendent. So then we're, we're left with what to do with the world of coming to be and passing away. Well, for Par Parmenides then, this is mere appearance. The world of coming to be and passing away is mere appearance. But there's a value judgment being made when somebody says that. Because reality is more valuable than mere appearance. The very word mere is a value, excuse me, a value judgment. And this will dominate Western philosophy. There's a way, there's a way of talking about the one. My dogs again. There's somebody, they're, do, they're applying um, fertilizer to my lawn. Organic fertilizer. <laughs> okay, so that's why they're barking. So the, the one of Heraclitus is imminent and transcendent, whereas the one of Parmenides is purely transcendent. Let me just make one more point before we move on, and I'll close on this. It's about these crossroads. Uh, this is something I, I came up with myself because. Usually, um, the study of the pre-Socratics is just trying to understand what all these people said, or someone like Heidegger who goes deeper, you know, tries to say, well, Parmenides, it looks like Parmenides and Heraclitus are talking about two different things, but both they're talking about being, you know, and that's Heidegger's main point. But it dawned on me um, that these are, they're opening up two radically different roads for Western philosophy. And the road most taken by to play with Robert Frost's wonderful poem, uh, you know, that, that struck me when I was a boy. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and I chose the one less traveled by and that made all the difference. That, that hit me hard when I was a boy. But this is, a, a, I don't think Robert Frost was thinking about Parmenides and Heraclitus, but these are, these are two, this is a crossroads, right at the beginnings of Western thought and Western philosophy and theology for the most part, has followed the Parmenidean way. Because Parmenides, because Plato rooted his philosophy in Parmenides. Although he knew all the pre-Socratics, 
I know that he knew that because in the Timaeus, one of the final the later dialogues of his is truly great. It's, it's, it's the first cosmogony and cosmology. It's the origin and nature of the universe. What Plato does is synthesize the whole of pre-Socratic thought into a cosmology and a cosmogony. And he puts it together in his own way. Um, so he, I know he was in possession of the whole pre-Socratic thought and he had all the, the full books before him. But when it came down to reality, the ultimate issues about reality, he sides with Parmenides. He uses Heraclitus, but only to describe the material world, the natural world, not the metaphysical world, which is the ground of the natural world. And then Plato was so influential, even on Aristotle, who parted company with him and became the first realist and created a tradition of his own, still those assumptions about reality uh, are there from Parmenides, from Plato into Aristotle. There's a lot of Plato in Aristotle, even though the two, you know, are two radically different schools of thought. Aristotle, the founder of realism, Plato, the founder of idealism. So these are the crossroads and I, I, I wanna point those out as we move through this. And then I wanna also, um, emphasize the implications of this because I mean let's just think about some of the implications from contemporary issues so we're living in an environmental crisis the storms for example that are hitting now they're bigger than any storms they have records of storms why and so there's climate change and global warming, and th those are two important aspects of the environmental crisis that we're in. So could this have anything to do with 2,500 years of denigration of the natural world, of creating, of taking the sacred out of nature, of thinking of the ultimate as a transcendent being that's not in nature? So what is nature then if it's not sacred? Well, it's just an object to be used by man. So in my mind, it's not an accident that we find ourselves two and a half millennia later in an environmental crisis. I'm not blaming Parmenides for the environmental crisis, but if you put this together with 2,500 years of, of denigration of the natural world, then you can see the results of that. What about when one group of people consider themselves naturally superior to another group of people, could that be related to anything in our Western philosophy? Well, what happens when you say, okay, humans are rational animals. Okay, we're animals and we have reason. But the animal part of us is not really real. The real part of us is reason. And what is reason? Well, it's based on the principle of identity and the laws of non-contradiction and laws of excluded middle and it's Western logic. Okay, but what happens when a people like the Native Americans or any other group of people don't think that way? Maybe they think more intuitively. And for some like Bergson, intuition is what makes contact with reality, not logical reasoning. Well, let's have a people who think more intuitively or into the sensuous world, into perception and the body and intuition and coexist with the inner life of things through intuitive knowing. But that's not thinking according to Western logic because thinking is deductive and inductive reasoning based on the principle of identity, which can be traced all the way back to Parmenides. Well then, white men must be much more superior to any colored person who, or any, any Native American. So white over color, men, why, why else would women have to work so hard just to get suffrage? Why shouldn't women be able to vote? Well, they're emotional, they're, they're more, they don't have reason. We can't allow women to decide the course of political decisions. 
and who's going to represent us. So we have 75 years of suffrage and finally. So it seems to me that this narrow definition of what it means to be human is to think logically and logical thinking is based on these three laws of thought that can be traced all the way back to the principle of identity that serves as a metaphysical foundation for bigotry and for chauvinism whenever one group of person of people consider themselves to be superior to another what do they call the people who they think are are inferior savages animals i see it even today when, you, when we watch movies and somebody wants to say the most horrific thing in the most hor hateful moment in literature or in film is an animal. As though animality were something to be embarrassed about. Well, we're different from the animals. We have reason. And reason is either it's based on the principle of identity, but is is. Okay. So these are some implications. I always like to look for the implications of ideas. Sometimes, as I said before, the implications are even more profound in, than, than the ideas themselves. So don't think that these abstract ideas have nothing to do with reality. Sometimes what I do is try to think about the practical implications of ideas and the relevancy, the existential relevancy of ideas. And sometimes if you want to get to the root cause of things, you have to unmask the cause. And only when that cause is eradicated, then we can bring things back to well-being. Like a good doctor, they look at symptoms, and they try to find the cause. Then they eliminate the cause, and then the symptoms dissolve. So unless we find the cause of bigotry, the causes of racism, the causes of the environmental crisis, there's not going to be any more change. They can talk all they want protest all they want, but it's not gonna make lasting change. In fact, that's what I'm hearing a lot of people in the Black Lives Matter movement, they're saying it never changes. But why doesn't it change? Because we haven't gotten to the, and we speak of the systemic racism or systemic causes, but nobody gets down to the stem to the cause. So unless we eradicate the cause, now I'm, again, I'm not saying everything is caused from Parmenides and Plato, and, but there is this tradition based on Parmenidean metaphysics that substantiates these atrocities. So we can't blame her Parmenides. As we can't blame Karl Marx for what happened in Russia and what the Russians did to Marxism, for example. And in the same way, we can't blame Parmenides. But these are the implications of the trajectory. All right, so those are my thoughts on the pre-Socratics. We need to move on. This is a survey course, nonetheless. So the next movement is Plato. And so read those um, parts of Plato that I will try to take something from the early dialogues, the middle dialogues, later dialogues. And um, I just love Plato. You know, you can love someone and learn so much from them and, and, and disagree with certain aspects of, of what they think. You know, so there's parts of Plato that I just completely disagree with, other parts that uh, my life would have never been as rich as it has been without Plato. He's just so great. He's a giant at the beginning. So you can't bypass this Plato. All right? All right, thank you.